Okay. Um, so this is mostly um, the first part of it is um, the stuff that I know about. Um, worked on the periphery of the problem, but it's not something I would go and give a talk about with the greatest accomplishments I have made. But it, uh, I was called out to talk about things that are not in my main line of research. So I found this thing that I, you know, pondered around on the periphery for a while, and I think it's a very interesting problem in genomics. And I in initially thought I was going to talk about um, some of the assembly graphs too, but then there is going to be a better talk tomorrow. So. Um, so the first is going to start with a genomics problem, and then it's going to go on um, another genomics problem that will effectively tie to something called graph plus, which I'll describe, and I've been also asked to talk a little bit about it, not initial idea. So um, here's a funny picture of uh, essentially describing crossover and meiosis. Let's say you have two um, uh, you know, pieces of um, genome from the same species. I just num uh, they're just called AP13 vs16 because there's, these are the actual names of them. Uh, you know, these are wheat bred uh, genomes, and let's say they're, um, one of them is kind of inbred. So, you know, there's the whole both copies of the chromosomes are the same. Um, it's not exactly perfectly possible to get completely inbred stuff, but you can get an approximation um, over generations. And AP13 is a pretty heterozygous. And you know, when you cross this over and get a um, progeny of hundreds of uh, new uh, wheat, you'll see a different uh, pattern of meiosis happening, right? It's going to cross over in a different place for every child, um, let's call them, you know, child. Um, so by looking at this, how, how things actually cross over, you can actually assemble what's called a genetic linkage map. So this used to be very useful, and I'll describe why it's still useful today. Uh, before uh, people were able to assemble genomes, this was the closest approximation you got in terms of what's in the genome. So you would look at, think of markers as single nucleotide polymorphisms. You and I have an A or C. This is the difference. And let's say each one of them is a marker. And then if you sequence a big population of plants and looking at how they cross over, you can then figure out, okay, marker A, SNP1 goes here, SNP2 goes here. And you can even for, uh, figure out the order between them because things that are physically close to each other are usually at a higher probability of staying together. Okay, so that's the basic approach. And here's uh, somewhat the, um, the data for the people that are uh, conceptually, uh, uh, you know, uh, challenged like me. They want to see the matrix and the output, and here's what it is. Um, uh, the, the columns is the number of markers, and the, uh, sorry, the rows are the number of markers and the columns are the individuals. So each, each individual has, let's say these uh, SNPs are only, you know, A and B, biallelic is the, uh, the term they use. Um, so it's, there's either an A or B in that individual for each marker, and sometimes there's absent because sequencing is expensive. So this is shallow sequenced. Um, and then your goal is to go from there to a grouping first, which will be chromosomes ideally, and then from there you go to a linkage map uh, after you order these things. So um, why is this still useful in 2010s when you can actually sequence data and get some sort of uh, assembly? Uh, and in contrast to what people will say is the problem of sequencing a genome is still partially solved. When people say they have assembled a genome, what often they mean is they made an approximation to it. Uh, so I think the picture here is a little too complicated for that, but I couldn't find a better one. What ends up happening once you assemble a genome using the existing technologies, you'll get, um, you'll, you'll get something called context, like contiguous uh, genome pieces that are you know, somewhat much longer than your inputs, but not a complete chromosome by any means, especially uh, for complex genomes. So then you have a bunch of co contexts, or maybe you have scaffolds. You can get some sort of long-range information and see how the contexts orient with respect to each other. But you have no idea where these scaffolds are supposed to go in the genome. So you get a bunch of uh, separate pieces of DNA that says, you know, if this is as close I could get to a continuous piece. What markers allow you to do once you do the linkage map is it says exactly this SNP goes to chromosome 7 at this location. Now you, all you need to do is to go back to your contic or scaffold and then basically anchor your scaffold into your map. So now you know how the... Uh, where the scaffolds go and how they orient with respect to each other. So that's the, still the use of genetic maps primarily uh, for this purpose. Um, I, there's, there's actually um, 
probably more uses, but this is a good citation uh, for that purpose. Um, what else do I want to say? There are other methods to do that too. But anyway, um, I think I said everything that I, that's in this slide. Uh, genetic maps are constructed by using the idea of the recombination frequencies. Um, you can think of markers as single nucleotide polymorphism for conceptual thing, and the goal is cluster, order, and then there's some statistical mapping from what I think is the correct distance versus what's the correct distance in physics, uh, in actual DNA, and then you do these three steps. Um, so the naive first step is even, sim looks like awfully simple just to cluster these things, is an M square calculation in pretty much all the software we tried. So what they do is they do every single pairwise comparison, and then um, they do link single linkage clustering after that. It works beautifully well, pretty accurate, and, and the single linkage clustering actually makes sense physically for this problem. Except that um, when you have millions of markers, this M square calculation takes an awful lot of time, and you don't really need to do this. So uh, the main idea what we uh, developed uh, here is, is an algorithm called bubble clusters, which essentially relies on the whole thing that um, this, this set of points are quasi-linear in, in space. It, they would be completely linear if this, there were no errors or no missing data. But due to these errors and missing data, they kind of look like a little bit off. But at the end of the day, they still look awfully linear. So by using um, this structure, you can basically create these representative points that's awfully similar to some of the ideas that people have developed in other clustering domains that use the uh, physical information. And, and it works uh, just fine. You get uh, you know, F scores to 0 0.9999, uh, so, and you don't do the M, M square calculation. But this is still an, not a graph problem, uh, exactly, even though it's an approximation. Here's the actual um, tricky graph problem that we haven't really dealt with. So the ordering step, by the textbook definition, is really traveling salesman. You have distance approximations for these things. And then uh, you want to order them. So what is the, the best ordering is indeed the, the definition of trailing salesman problem. Uh, we have tried a lot of machine learning tricks where the input is the distances and the output is, you know, since we believe it's you know, one to two uh, dimensional space at most, we can do multi-dimensional uh, scaling like ideas. Okay, how does this distance measures go into space? None of these things worked. Probably our Similarity metric uh, is not exactly f um, following the assumptions of those ideas because the similarity between two points, the lot score that's common logarithm is of odds is really not obeying um, any of the triangle equality in the presence of missing data, especially. But anyway, other people have uh, figured out uh, somewhat successful uh, approximations and they gained popularity. One of them is really goes to the like decades old idea that um, at, at TSP that is in the, this is actually not even true. TSP needs to be metric for this approximation to make sense, but um, they can also use the uh, properties of the, this genomic maps to use MST as an approximation for that. It's more involved than just applying it. You, uh, you, you have to talk a lot about the missing data and how it uh, matters in this case. But that's a cool application in this problem. And another cool one is, let's say you have two maps or three maps for the same species. You got them from different sequencing data, right? But these are really the maps of the same species. And how are you going to integrate them, right? Uh, they might be different resolution. Even if they're the same resolution, it's possible that one map had an error due to the sequencing bias in one technology, and the other one makes an error in some other phase. So by integrating them, you can get a perfect map, right? Um, so it's a really old paper in some sense. For, this, for biology, things like one and, uh, 15 years is pretty old. But you'll recognize one familiar name in the third author, uh, if you're uh, not biologist. Um, I don't know how he got into it. I actually met uh, at dinner with John Clymer and asked the, the background story about this. Um, so I think he's friends with one of the, collab uh, one of the co authors here, and they were just having a dinner party. And uh, she explained uh, the problem, and that's how he got into it. Uh, it the, the solution is pretty easy. You basically construct a directed graph. You have the ordering from uh, one map uh, constructing software and ordering from another map constructing software. 
Uh, so you basically do a directed graph on each one of them. Once you integrate them, if there is a cycle, that means there's an inconsistency between these your maps. But anything outside the cycles is fine. So all you need to do is to identify strongly connected components and contract them into super vertices. Anything else is your consistent map. And then you can deal with the uh, strongly connected components and try to find what's the consensus there. Uh, even if there's an inconsistency, if there are three maps and two of them favor one order, you probably will choose that, something like that. Um, so that's a cool problem that I think is a little under, um, uh, underrated. Um, if anyone wants to care, it's all them. I'll move on to some other problem in genomics. This is um, really how do you uh, cluster um, proteins, right? So one of the reasons we cluster proteins is to find something called a protein family, right? Like a group of families that share, a group of proteins that share a common evolutionary origin, um, probably reflected by their related functions. So this is without using the structure, um, usually. Um, we're gonna try to do that. We're just gonna try to do that with sequence similarity. And um, why would you even find families? Let's say you get a sample from the environment and there's lots of uh, proteins there. Some of them you know the function, some of them you don't. Now you can infer the function of the things that you haven't seen before just because they actually belong to the same family. That's your basically primary hypothesis. Uh, it can be wrong, but it's 99% correct. If things cluster together in sequence space, usually they probably come from the same protein family. What's even more exciting for our collaborators is when some group of proteins clusters into their own um, cluster that don't share any known protein. Those are usually novel protein families and they can probably encode things that nobody ever knew about. I'm not a biologist, but I think I started getting an appreciation. Input output, uh, really simple. The input is some sort of pairwise similarity that's computed by whatever your favorite sequence comparison software, BLAST, whatnot is. And you want to actually get a clusters of similar proteins. Scale is pretty large. Um, you can think of this as trillions of pairwise similarities. We came half a trillion at this point, um, but uh, really big data. So you, know, you can choose a lot. I don't want to say this, but clustering algorithms are a dime a dozen. Whenever I say that, someone, get, someone gets offended. But uh, I think I actually believe there is a purpose for that, uh, too, uh, because depending on your domains, some algorithms make more sense than the others because of the physical constraints of that uh, problem domain. So MCL macro clustering is horribly um, popular in this um, problem domain. Um, and some of the codes, um, when people actually evaluate it and try to figure out whether uh, they, they want to use other clustering algorithms. It turned out, especially for this um, protein sequence analysis, that's not the case. First, it's really r robust for alterations of the graph. Um, that's not usually common in a lot of algorithms that's been tried. And, um, and it's actually pretty fast. However, fast is you know, uh, something that's in the eye of the beholder. I, what I call fast. Um, is something usually linear time. MCL is nothing close to linear time, right? So what does it do? That basically expands the graph, meaning that it does a random walk from every single vertex. Of course, this will eventually become a dense vertex if it's connected, so you don't want to do that. You can't just have you know, uh, a billion vertex squared memory, even in your supercomputers. Um, the way it uh, avoids that somewhat is after every expansion, you're allowed to prune by two methods. One of them is a brute force filter. The other one is a top K. Basically, for each vertex, you only choose the, um, the highest K connections. And the way this is forced to convergence is, is actually not the expansion. It's the so-called inflation step, which is every element uh, on a column is first squared. Take the power. This is actually not squared. It can be any parameter. It can be cubed, fourth, whatever. And then you normalize again that, uh, that column. So what happens for really small entries, once you square them uh, relative to the slightly larger entries, the really small ones go to zero much quicker, right? So they will get eliminated by the pruning after inflation. Uh, and this, this looks very hand wavy, but it's not. You can actually read pretty good uh, arguments about why this process converges and why it's actually not very uh, 
uh, fragile in terms of these parameter settings. It's going to change the convergence speed. Uh, and if you, unless you drag these values to really extreme cases, especially the pruning parameters, it will converge the right con uh, clusters uh, with a lot of um, you know, wiggle room in there. OK, uh, so what did we do? This is actually my last slide on this topic, which is amazing. Um, I, I don't want to talk too much about the details on this. Uh, you can read the papers. Um, the sequential algorithm, or even its shared memory implementation, basically um, the bottleneck is in the expansion. You square a sparse matrix. Um, that's pretty expensive. Uh, the sequential algorithm does it column by column. It basically only finds the uh, A times the first column of uh, A itself, and then go, prunes it and goes to the second one. That's great, and it has the minimum memory storage because you can prune immediately. Um, in parallel, um, trying to get a good scaling from that algorithm when you're trying to just do one sparse matrix times sparse vectors, that's not a good idea. Uh, you, you can get probably a speed up up to as many non-zeros as you have in the sparse matrix. Let's say it's 100. That's the best you can hope for. Anything beyond that, you're going to be stuck. But if you do the whole sparse matrix matrix, even though you have a lot of parallelism, you will basically run out of memory very quickly. You will never be able to even get to the pruning stage. The intermediate memory will be too large. So what HIP-MCL is what we called our high performance MCL does is you, you select the number of columns that you want to expand at, at any point. And it depends on your memory consumption and how much parallelism you have. So you basically try to keep it as large as possible without bloating your memory. Um, and um, it dynamically chooses that. So it can actually cluster things um, pretty fast. These, are, these, these kind of um, problems um, were considered out of reach for M uh, MCL. And they've been using some cheaper algorithms that they didn't like the results. So this works much really good. The problem I actually want to say is, so what is Cori? Cori is a supercomputing up there that has about 9,000 um, nodes. So this is using about one-fourth of the whole supercomputer. It's one of the top 10, I think. And this is actually a very nasty calculation um, because every other run, one of the cores die in two and a half hours. <laughs> Somehow, like you have to restart. Some, some memory error happens. Um, so we had to run this thing, I think, twice for each one of these data sets. It, one run always uh, fails, and you, you lose a lot of uh, compute hours. Um, and we're working on improving that. That's been published in nucleic acids research recently. So let's come to Graph Plus, and it's going to connect nicely with the last um, protein clustering work I talked about. So what is Graph Plus? Um, so the Graph Plus started um, by... Uh, under the dictatorship of my colleague Tim Matson from Intel. So what Tim said is, look, um, I see this uh, graph processing frameworks that uses the linear algebra thing, and they are, at the moment there's like three, four of them. And I do want to go to my engineers and tell them to implement this idea, but I can't tell them without what exactly they're going to implement. And they want it to be running on every platform. so. They want a standards bank. Uh, OK, so then you, why don't you guys come together? I will shepherd it. And we, we write a standard API for this. OK, so the, the idea is not graph plus. The idea is graphs in the language of linear algebra. And that there's a Cyan book for that. You can Google that thing. Um, you can, it's actually cited. Everything you want to know probably is referred from graphplus.org. And we ran a workshop. And that workshop is linked from there, too. So the idea is like we came. And at this point, there is enough consensus that we can build a common API. It's not possible in a lot of other um, uh, domains, including the graphs in general. But the restricted domain of doing graphs in linear algebra, which I'll describe how it do is done, um, is actually not that big. So it is, it's, it's, uh, there wasn't a lot of friction. Um, this is important. And this is a new slide that I never used. So the purpose of graph plus, the main target, is the kind of combinatorial graph algorithms, those involving standard graph traversals, and which didn't map to existing hardware well, and which didn't parallelize well. They used queues and stacks and serial data structures, but the computation didn't really call for it explicitly. It was just because the, the textbooks has described those problems like that. 
Th that's graph plus main goal, is to make such traversal based and other combinatorial graph algorithms faster. It is applicable to methods like spectral uh, clustering and whatnot, but that's not the main goal and that's not the driver. So there's, you know, just because there's the word matrices that happen in both, there's the conception that graph plus is used for spectral methods. It's actually the opposite. It, 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 you know, for spectral methods, you need like solvers. We don't provide any solvers. You can't get eigenvalues from graph plus. Um, the kind of graph plus examples we uh, gave is like things like between centrality, Markov clustering, but first search, independent sets, you know, bipartite graph matching, ordering, pretty much any of them are combinatorial algorithms at the end of the day, right? Um, so, and the, the rest is pretty known. So, so what, is, what do I mean with graphs in the language of matrices? Let's say you want to do bread first search. It's my basic slide, and this is your graph. This is smaller than Carita Club. I probably need a bigger award than this. But this is our famous graph because it was in the uh, old book, Cyan book. Um, so now I think it's recognized. And then you just basically write your um, sparse adjacency matrix, even though I represent it as an adjacency matrix, this is not implemented in squares, just to make it clear. So how do you do a breadth first search from starting from vertex one? All you need to do is to multiply your A transpose with a vector that has only one vertex, which is one at the value location one. So once you multiply it, what you will find is two non-zeros that are exactly the vertices that are one hop away from your starting vertex. And now to do your next step of expansion, all you need to do is to move your output vertex um, and renumber the values uh, to their indices and do it again. Now from two and four, you will reach to three, seven, and five. So remember, now what's going on here is every, for every scalar multiplication, I'm executing a, a, a simple a select operation, which just propagates the second value that is passed, a function that propagates the second value, which is the index on the vectors. And if there is a collusion and need, the addition needs to be executed, in this case, I'm going to use min, uh, the minimum label, but breadth first search would be correct if I just picked a random one. Minimum is good because it becomes deterministic. Um, in this case, like two and four are reaching uh, seven at the same time, but uh, since I declared my addition as two, um, it, it, that one wins. So the formalism for this is called a semi-ring. We call it a semi-ring. If you look at the uh, mathematics textbook of a semi-ring, this is not a semi-ring. Because you cannot define rings, or fields, or whatnot on more than one set. But I'm saying that the, the matrix can be Boolean, and the vector can be integer. And in fact, I'm going to even say you can put timestamps on this one, and whatever. Um, so there can be t three different domains, input one domain, input two domain, and output domain, and that's fine. The system is, will not care. It's going to run correctly, but mathematically, it's kind of not defined, right? To, to have a, a, you know, an algebraic ob object like a ring or semi-ring on three different objects does not make sense. But for a system, it, it doesn't matter. So it's pretty flexible for that purpose. Um, we have made a lot of innovations in graph plus, but I don't need to go into that. Um, at the end, what they allow is it's as efficient as you can get by not going through this abstraction of linear algebra. But why am I then going through the abstraction? Because once I implement this primitive as efficiently as possible, you just change the same ring, you change addition, multiplication, and uh, the additive identity, and then you get independent sets. And you change that little operation, you get graph matching, you get graph ordering. So you just need to uh, implement the primitives, which are less than 10 in the graph plus, efficiently to get good performance. And in the code, it really looks like this. The top is only because this is C. We didn't want to go into fight of C++ or whatnot. And I really appreciate, Eric, uh, what um, we have done at some point is we tried to write a wrapper to our distributed um, graph uh, processing uh, engine, combinatorial blast, in Python. We did it. Um, it was so painful. Uh, <laughs> Um, and we, of course, never wanted to spend another s student's career on writing wrappers and gluing Python to C++ in the features. Um, so um, I appreciate that there is good software for the kind of things that we want to do, uh, like NetworkX. Um, this is for things where you really need performance. And this is for things um, where you want to scale up. 
because uh, using these primitives, you'll be able to write really fast distributed memory stuff. In fact, that's what most of the existing software is about, um, parallelism. Um, and in case you're wondering how this connects to protein clustering, the, the hardest primitive in graph plus, in some hard uh, definition of hard, the richest primitive that allows you a lot of optimization is multiplication of two sparse matrices. And that was exactly what was going on in uh, protein clustering. So that's the connection. And then you can do your innovation inside this problem, right? So um, what do I mean with that is you can basically come up with better algorithms, especially parallel algorithms that avoid communication. These become really complicated and probably an overkill for a single application to come up with algorithms that will avoid communication and be paper worthy just for one application. But you can think of the primitive, you know, spend your years figuring out new algorithms that are an order of magnitude faster at large scale because you know that it's gonna accelerate five different applications, 10 different applications, and things that you don't even know about. Like most of the citations to this work doesn't come from graphs that I thought would come. It comes from these guys that do electronic structure calculations for, for unknown reasons to me. Um, but that's all. Thank you. I have a between a centrality example that I won't go through. Second. You don't ask me questions enough on the corridor? I, I think he, he, he suggested I shouldn't be asking questions. <laughs> I know. No, 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 go, go for it. Um, Jesus. Uh, the, is the idea behind graph blasts or these sort of linear algebra techniques uh, only performance improvement or other complexity improvements that you can get in this formulation? It's really performance, like also an abstraction. Um, actually, okay, let me answer this by using this between a centrality example. So people have been finding, so this is, between a centrality is expensive because for exact calculation, you have to find shortest path from every starting vertex and you don't need to do all of it. If I get a good sample, you can just do a sample of the starting vertices, but still it's a lot of them to get a good sample. And people over the years like, okay, I'm gonna accelerate this thing. So they started accelerating the shortest path calculation first and then figured out, well, I can get more parallelism by running from multiple source, source vertices at the same time. The, everything, every one of these is a new paper. But in the end, all you need to do is, okay, what is breadth for search from multiple source vertices? Is matrix times matrix. I already optimized this thing. I didn't think about parallelism here in terms of vertices, edges. But once I parallelize this operation efficiently, I actually get for free three levels of parallelism without thinking of the problem. I parallelize over the searches, of, which is the columns of B. I parallelize over the vertices, which is the inner dimension. I parallelize over the adjacency of each one of these vertices, which is the rows of A transpose. But I never thought about it this way when I implemented it. It's so just like a abstraction is a little higher. You don't need to worry about the particular problem. So l let me ask a dual question. Uh, if you take uh, a graph algorithm, can you always match the complexity of the best algorithm that's a good linear algebra formulation? That's an excellent problem. And my colleague Jeremy Kepner at MIT Lincoln Labs have these slides that exactly answer that question. Not every problem. And I'll tell you my hypothesis about which problems exactly fail. By looking at it, it looks like the problems that fail are precisely the problems that have either dependence on some sort of priority queue data structure, like um, this is, uh, this is un undirected. Um, I'm cheating here. Uh, no, unweighted, that's not undirected. This is directed, but unweighted. There's no priority queue here. Um, the ones that have priority queues, like the extra shortest path, and the things that are based on depth first search. Uh, but uh, we don't know of good parallel algorithms for those good parallelizations of those algorithms anyway. There is, some of them are inherently unparallelizable. Depth first search is inherently sequential, and diextra is inherently sequential. Um, so the theory, the hypothesis I have is anything that would scale already scales in this abstraction. Like it, the problems that doesn't scale, they, they have inherent problems. Uh, that, you, that no abstraction will fix. It doesn't even make sense because um, 
let's say let's take uh, strongly connected components. Okay, so the Tajans algorithm is linear time, fine, and the best par other parallel algorithm is like hand wave. <laughs> okay, there is no even bound. You basically uh, pick a random vertex, look at its outgoing and incoming uh, classes. You do uh, divide and conquer you, because it separates your remaining vertices into three classes, and there's no bound as far as I know. Um, but that doesn't, that's not the fault of graph plots, it's just there's no parallel algorithm for that. Uh, this depends. <laughs>